a very important thing that genesis, geneticists need to do is to find genes. And one uh, technique uh, that is used uh, is uh, three-point mapping. And in Drosophila, uh, this is exciting because once one finds a gene in fruit flies, one can get a sequence, and then one can then develop a probe for that sequence and then ask, do humans have such a sequence? And so a lot of people might ask, who cares you know, where genes are? But once again, once you find a gene, you can study it and see if humans have it, see if it's linked to any diseases. It, it's, it's rather exciting. And so here is a description of three-point crosses in Drosophila. I have a playlist with the videos that you'll see going on in the background, which goes through it a bit more slowly. This is kind of an overview. And once again, feel free to uh, refer to the individual uh, videos in this playlist. Uh, I'm going to use the easy scenario of sex-linked traits in Drosophila. That way uh, we only need to count the males and we know what genotype everyone has because in males they only have one X chromosome and one can see the genes expressed. Um, one can do this cross with um, autosomal genes as well. It's just a bit more involved. So let's just start with an easy case here. So the question then is, let's say we know that three genes exist on the X chromosome in Drosophila. Let's call them A, B, and C, although at this point we really don't know their order. That's the point. We want to find these genes. So this is you know, just kind of an arbitrary placing of A, B, C at the outset. And let's say, for example, uh, that one controls body color, you know, giving uh, a mutant yellow body color. Another controls eye color, giving a mutant white wing uh, or white eye. And then another, say, controls wing length, making the, uh, the wings, say, shorter or miniature. Notice that here the, ling the wings extend well beyond the tips of the legs, whereas here that uh, they uh, don't. Well, if a mutant male in this case is mated to a wild type female, then the female offspring that they have will then get an X chromosome from each of their parents. So now they have two X chromosomes, one with all three of the uh, mutants, uh, because that's what their father was. Uh, their father was yellow and white and miniature, had all three of uh, the mutations, while the mother had three wild type alleles for these genes. Now, when that female fruit fly makes her own ova, some ova will have all three wild type alleles uh, in them, plus, 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 just like her mother. Some uh, of her ova will have X chromosomes with all three uh, mutant alleles, yellow, white, and miniature, just like her father. These would be called non-recombinants because uh, they would inherit an X chromosome, which is essentially equivalent to that of uh, one of the parental uh, genotypes with all of the three mutants still linked or all three wild type alleles still linked. So these are the non-recombinants and we'll have to count them in the F2 generation, uh, the grandchildren. But then again, one will then notice uh, that there will be some um, uh, uh, flies which have one uh, or two of the mutations, but not all three. So they might have white eyes or yellow and miniature bodies. They might have miniature uh, uh, wings. Uh, I'm sorry, miniature wings. Uh, miniature wings and yellow and uh, white uh, phenotypes, or white and miniature and yellow. So notice that sometimes they could have one gene by itself, white or yellow or miniature, and sometimes both, yellow and miniature, but not white. Uh, yellow and white, but not miniature, um, white and miniature, but not yellow, all right? Now, as we'll see, this is because recombination has occurred and one of the mutant alleles has moved. So if white moves, then either white will be it by itself or yellow and white will remain without, um, or yellow and miniature will remain without white. If yellow moves, then yellow will either be by itself or white and miniature. Uh, will uh, be present together without yellow. If miniature moves, then um, either miniature will be by itself uh, or yellow and white uh, will be by uh, themselves without um, miniature. And then the trick would then be to count those. 
And the reason we want to count those is that this recombination, which is breaking the linkage group, will happen more frequently when genes are situated farther apart um, uh, from uh, each other. So once again, if this is that F1 female, she has one X chromosome she got from her mother with three wild type alleles and one X chromosome she got from her father with all three mutant alleles. And if um, she passes these down to her male offspring, once again, this is the reason to count males that uh, each will only get one X chromosome. We don't have to worry about a recessive allele being hidden in a heterozygote. Uh, so some males will get three wild type alleles and then look like the grandmother with all three wild uh, traits. And some males will get uh, three mutant alleles and look like just uh, their grandfather. So these would be the non-recombinants. Right. But in contrast, recombination, crossing over, can shuffle these linkage groups. And the frequency of crossing over will be determined by the distance these genes are separated from each other. So for example, if we were to separate, say, um, the A gene from the other two, where would recombination have to occur, all right, for the A now to be separated? So the wild type uh, allele for the A gene separating from the mutant allele, uh, to, I'm sorry, bound together with the mutant alleles for B and C. Well, recombination would have to occur somewhere in that zone. If the um, C gene, uh, uh, the wild type allele here in blue, were then to be separated so that it would be found with the mutants, where would uh, recombination have to occur? It would have to occur in this area, which is then a smaller uh, region, uh, et cetera. If the B gene were to be separated from the other two, well, we now know that this is in the middle in this analogy. We don't know which of the genes in our uh, question um, uh, this would uh, occur in. Well, this could actually only occur. The only way you could separate the middle gene from this group of three is if you had two crossover events, one here and one here. So that would actually make it then less likely that these two events occur. So um, how would we then calculate this? Well, I then go through two separate crosses uh, just to give my students practice. So let's do a cross where um, a fly, and this is a female fly in this case, it doesn't matter where the mutation is. Uh, it could be either in the female or uh, the male because we only count the male flies of the F2 generation, uh, where the mutations are done. So here we have a female who has vermilion eyes, singed bristles, and lacks cross veins in her wings, like that one, whereas the male is wild type for all of uh, these three alleles. So he has uh, three wild type alleles for the vermilion gene, the singed gene, and the cross veinless gene. She has the mutant alleles for each of these. And then they produce offspring. Now, the males are all mutant because they receive their X linked, um, their X chromosomes from their mother. Uh, we know that these are X linked uh, traits in our cross. We could do this with autosomal genes as well. Um, it would just be a little more complicated in our analysis uh, given that uh, males are easy to identify uh, with their alleles because they only have one X-linked copy of a gene. Um, and so uh, there are no heterozygotes to con uh, contend with. Now, the females here are uh, wild type for all alleles, but remember that their mother had all three mutant alleles so that the males have only one X chromosome with both with vermilion and singed and cross veinless, while the females, they have two X chromosomes. One has three wild type alleles, one has uh, three mutant alleles. Now, when she makes ova, all right, in her uh, oogenesis, um, the X chromosomes that she puts into her ova gets passed down to the males. So if we only count the males of the F2 generation, 
then it does not matter what uh, the male contributed, the male parent, um, because that male parent gives X chromosomes to female flies. So these male flies of the F2 generation, they are getting uh, the X chromosomes from their F1 mother. Now, since their F1 mother uh, had two X chromosomes, one with three wild type alleles and one with three mutant alleles, if a male fly in the next generation gets either of these X chromosomes, they would then either have all um, wild type traits, like the uh, grandfather fly in this cross, uh, or all three mutant traits, like the grandmother fly in this cross, they would be non-recombinants. They would be receiving an X chromosome that had not undergone crossing over. And so then the allele order is the same as it was. But however, in uh, the F1 female's ovaries, crossing over could occur in such a way that the vermilion gene moves relative to singed and cross famous. And if that then occurs, then there will be flies that have vermilion eyes, but not singed bristles and cross veinless. The vermilion mutation would be by itself. Or singed and cross veinless would be together, but not uh, with vermilion. So here where you would have a fly with two mutant conditions, singed bristles and cross veinless wings, um, but no vermilion eyes. So these are recombinant flies, all right? And they have resulted when vermilion moved. But in other cases, singed will move, all right, to create flies in which singed is by itself when an X chromosome is the only mutation, or vermilion and cross veinless are together, but singed is not. Now I'm putting singed in the middle here, but the reason we're doing this experiment is to find out the gene order. That's an arbitrary position. We don't know which gene is in the middle at this point. Here we have flies with singed bristles, but not the other two conditions. Here we have flies with vermilion eyes and cross famous wings, but not singed bristles. Finally, cross veinless could move in a crossover uh, event. And this would produce uh, flies uh, which uh, had um, uh, cross veinless as their only uh, trait or which had vermilion and singed. And so we will be counting eight kinds of flies in the F2 generation, two of which are non-recombinants because they have either all three wild type alleles or all three mutant alleles. And then we will have some with just vermilion, some with just singed, some with just cross veinless, or singed and cross veinless, vermilion and cross veinless, or vermilion and singed. So we are now going to go through the F2 males and count all of the two kinds of non-recombinants and all of the six kinds of uh, recombinants. So let's say that we do that. And then we get the numbers of each. Uh, there will be a large number of the non-recombinants, say 400 and 403, and we'll just uh, keep those numbers uh, in the back of our minds for right now. Um, if we count flies, which are either vermilion or singed cross veinless, the way that you get those flies, which are vermilion or singed cross veinless, is if vermilion moves, all right? So vermilion needs to move relative to the other two for those two phenotypes. There has to be a crossover event which changes vermilion's position relative to the other two. So let's say we count 60 vermilion flies and 68 uh, singed cross veinless flies. We will set up three columns. One, where there's a crossover event between vermilion and singed. Two, where there's a crossover event between vermilion and cross veinless. And three, where there's a crossover event between singed and cross veinless. Three columns. And then we will write each of these two numbers, 60 and 68, under any column where vermilion moves relative to one of those other two genes. So if vermilion moved to, to give us these 60 flies and these 68 flies, we will write 60 and 68 above the column where vermilion moves relative to singed, 
and above this column where vermilion moves relative to cross veins, okay? Because the only way you get those two phenotypes is if vermilion moves. Then in our next category of flies, we will see that singed has moved. So if we bring out our next two uh, phenotypes, all right, singed is by itself, or vermilion and cross veinless are together without singed. The only way that we get these flies is once again, if singed moves relative to the other two. So we're going to take these totals of flies, four singed flies, three vermilion cross veinless flies, and we will write those numbers um, under any column where singed has moved. So here you can see Singed has moved relative to vermilion, so we'll bring the four and the three over here. And here you can see that singed has moved relative to cross veinless, so we will bring the four and the three over there. Okay. Finally, um, cross veinless moves uh, to give us flies uh, where cross veinless is by itself or when vermilion and singed uh, uh, are uh, together. So we will then take those flies, 14 cross veinless and 10 vermilion singed, and write those totals under any column where cross veinless moves relative to uh, another gene. So here, cross veinless has moved relative to vermilion, and here, uh, cross veinless has moved relative to singed. Um, and so, we took our totals of uh, flies and added them to these three columns. Now, with all of the mutant flies that we counted and all of the wild type, or I'm sorry, all of the non-recombinant flies that we counted, my fault, let me repeat, all of the recombinant flies that we counted and all of the non-recombinant uh, flies that we counted, there were 962 uh, total flies. If we add these columns, so all of these numbers equals 135, all of these numbers uh, equals 152, all of these equal um, uh, 31, then we can divide each of these three totals in blue by the total number of flies, which was 962. And this then gives us the um, map units which separate any of these two alleles. Here's the biggest number. So 152, that's the most recombination. Those two genes would therefore be the two which are farthest apart. Recombination is most likely to separate genes which are farther apart. So on this X chromosome, vermilion is at one end and cross veinless is at another. If vermilion and cross veinless are at opposite ends, then singed must be in the middle. Where in the middle? Well, if you look here, uh, notice that singed is far from cross veinless. 135 is a big number, but singed, I'm sorry, singed is, is far from vermilion. I'm sorry, singed is far from vermilion. But singed is close to cross veinless. Notice this is a small number. So rather than put singed right smack in the middle, we would put singed close to cross veinless, given that it only rarely is separated from cross veinless, but at a, a greater, um, distance from vermilion because of this number. If we take these and divide them by the total number of flies that we've counted, we come up with percentages, all right, which are called map units. You could actually publish these numbers and say there are 15.8 map units which separate the two ends and then singed is in the middle. 3.2 map units from cross veinless, very close, but 14 um, uh, map units uh, from uh, vermilion. So if we were going to come up uh, with this three-point cross, we are almost done. The only problem is, and this is what I then will go through in the last part of this video, is you might notice that if you were to add the distance between vermilion and singed at 14.0, and the distance between singed and cross veinless at 3.2, that number is 17.2. That is greater than the 15.8 that we calculate between vermilion and cross veinless. And there's a reason for that. 
Um, the reason for that is uh, that, and the reason that we now have to make this minor adjustment is think about singed. A second ago, we did not know that it was in the middle. Now we do. But then the problem is, how do you move the middle gene? The way that you move the middle gene is not to have one crossover event, but two crossover events. All right, one has to occur between vermilion and singed, and one has to occur between singed and cross veinless. All right, so look here at our um, column where it says vermilion and cross veinless. Is there a crossover event here? We did not put these four flies in this column. We did not put these three flies in this column. But now that we know that singe is in the middle, obviously there were crossover events between vermilion and cross veinless. So this column was uh, underrepresented. For each of these four flies, there were two crossover events. For each of these three flies, there were two crossover events. So what we're going to do is take this number four and double it because uh, you couldn't have a singe fly without two crossover events. And take this number three and double it because you couldn't have vermilion and uh, cross veinless flies uh, without uh, two crossover events. So we double this to make eight, we double this to make six. And then we take eight and six and we add them to this column because uh, crossover events had occurred between the two ends, but we just didn't know which was the middle at the time. If you then take the eight and six and add them to this column, now um, this uh, number is uh, truer uh, to what actually occurred. And when you calculate the map units, it's not going uh, to be uh, the previous value, but now it's going to be 17.3. And now we have a greater agreement between the uh, value we would calculate from uh, the two ends, or if we calculated uh, this portion and this portion and added them together, because now we've included the double crossovers. Um, now, uh, for my students, uh, hearing this one time typically uh, is not enough. So in my playlist, I then uh, go through a, another cross uh, with three X-linked trait. Uh, cut wings, where there's a, a kind of a V-shaped notch at the end, white eyes and miniature wings. Uh, so once again, uh, here is a cross where the male has three wild type traits, the female has three mutant traits, and I go through all of the same uh, steps. So once again, I have a playlist which goes through this a little more slowly, uh, but this was an overview of how one does a three-point cross in Drosophila, at the result of which you can actually say, I know where the genes are. I know which ones are on the ends, which ones are in the middle. I know the map units which separate them. And then this gets you closer once you know where a gene is. Uh, you can you know, then ultimately get a sequence of it and then maybe even ask, now do humans have a version of this gene?